Canada used to be a country that cared about basic rights and freedoms. In fact, every political party in Canada used to talk a good game about protecting the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and upholding our sacred liberties. But then COVID happened and everything changed. I'm Candace Malcolm and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning into the program. I'm gonna stop you right now and say that if you're watching this video on YouTube, please don't forget to like this video, to subscribe to True North, and to turn on your notification bell so that you never miss an episode. If you're watching on Facebook, please like this video, share it with your friends, and leave us a comment. Finally, if you're listening to this podcast over on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, please subscribe to The Candice Malcolm Show. And if you like the program, if you like what you hear, and you wanna support us, please consider leaving us a five-star review. It really helps us out with the ratings and with the discoverability of this podcast. So today I wanna to talk about civil liberties. I wanna talk about the importance specifically of writing and reporting about civil liberties because it seems like a value that we used to all share in this country, something that we used to hold near and dear. And increasingly with COVID, increasingly, I mean, it's been this way since the start of the pandemic, what we see instead is every politician is more than willing to sacrifice liberty, sacrifice freedoms of Canadians in exchange for security, for safety, and for public health. And I think it's having a really damaging impact on our society. So I want to bring in the newest True North employee, the newest journalist that we've hired at True North. His name is Harley Sims. He is a writer and a linguist living in the Fraser Canyon in British Columbia. In fact, he lives right in the middle of some of the horrible flooding that we've seen uh, recently. So we can ask him a little bit about that. But Harley's work ranges from law enforcement to literature. He's very, very well read, very well educated. He has a PhD in English from the University of Toronto. And Harley decided to join the True North team to, to come on board as a journalist in part to fight back against some of the government's heavy handed measures their draconian measures that do limit the uh, freedoms of Canadians. And so specifically, he's going to be helping us report and write on issues regarding civil liberties. So. Harley, first of all, thank you for joining True North and, and thank you for joining the program today. It's great to be part of the team, Candace. Thanks a lot. Great. Well, so first, I mean, uh, this is probably uh, our audience's first time meeting you or, or hearing from you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who, who are you and, and why did you decide to come join True North? Oh, well, Kenneth, I grew up in British Columbia. Um, my uh, dad is a heavy duty mechanic, so I grew up around big equipment, pulled a lot of wrenches myself. I grew up rural, really proud of it, playing hockey, hunting, snowmobiling, all that stuff. Um, I married my high school sweetheart, though, on the island, and she just had to get to Ottawa and see how things worked. So I followed her out um, to Parliament. Uh, I went to university. And I just uh, stayed there. I remember one day my dad um, coming out of the pit, dumped 20 liters of uh, black oil on himself. He looked at me and he said, Harley, just stay in school. Stay." <laughs> so I kind of did. Um, and uh, I uh, climbed out with a PhD in English at the end of it. I always loved uh, reading and writing. Uh, I've uh, lived in uh, Ontario, lived in uh, Nova Scotia. I homeschooled my children um, for a while and uh, worked as a writer, editor, freelancer from there. Uh, I've also worked as a bouncer and uh, worked in uh, law enforcement out here in British Columbia. And uh, I guess like everybody at True North, um, I've just grown really concerned about uh, what's happening uh, with our ability to, you know, just get together with people. I mean, you don't even need to get fancy with what our constitutional rights are at this point. All we have to do is just, you know, get in our cars and drive and we can see what we aren't allowed to do, where we aren't allowed to go anymore. And uh, anything from, uh, you know, even churches, uh, cadets, uh, volunteer groups. I'm worried that once uh, the mortar has been removed from these institutions, they're never going to be uh, rebuilt again. Uh, so uh, it's just been very important um, for me to, uh, to join you and to be able to uh, speak about this, even though, as we've said earlier, it's like drinking from a fire hose at this point. You don't have to look very far at all to find violations of civil liberties. It just seems to be a, a part of our everyday lives at this point. It's, it's so true and it's so sad. I mean, when, when you're talking about all those institutions and organizations that haven't been able to get together, I mean, th those are the things that really make up a core of a community and of a society. I mean, they're what Edmund Burke called the little platoons. And when you have these little platoons that are being prevented from getting together 
people present, prevented from entering in their own community and having the kinds of bonds and relationships uh, that, that you need, frankly, to survive an ordeal like the one that we're all going through. I mean, it's almost like I, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, and, and viewers know that, but it's like, man, if you were to design a way to really append society and destroy it from the inside, it, it would be by using some of these measures that we've seen. And often they're good, they're well intended. I mean, I think that the politicians really do want to, you know, have, have a safe and free society. It's just that they're much more willing um, to, to, to emphasize the safety over, over, over the health. So Harley, can you give us a few examples of some of the most heavy handed um, things that you've seen um, either in your community out there, British Columbia, or, or across the country? Uh, well, I've lived in uh, big cities, and I've also lived in very small towns. Uh, in a big city, uh, I think we tend to keep to ourselves. Uh, we tend to associate with going out of doors as being um, kind of a, you know, a, you know, uh, being more aware of, of, of where we can't go. We're surrounded by private institutions, government institutes. We can't go here. We can't go there. We uh, cost money to get in here, the things like that. I think we're more used to restricted freedoms in a city. But when you live in a small community, uh, you tend to know um, everybody. You tend to know the people that run the businesses. You tend to be part of organizations. And uh, just, uh, just simply getting together with a volunteer group, um, depending on you know, the ages of the people involved, uh, has been uh, very difficult, uh, it's, or else it's been uh, put on hold for a year, and then people are just starting to get back together. Um, uh, getting uh, cadets, for example, my daughter is in cadets. Um, they, they didn't meet for about a year, and they're just starting to meet again, but of course there are limitations in place. Um, I, I feel exactly the same way you do. I think that there are good intentions. I mean, look, you know, the path to hell is paved with them, but let's just you know take them face value for now. Um, but you're right, if, if there were a conspiracy, um, and if indeed government forces were seeking a way to undermine the, the everyday freedoms of, of, of the people, then uh, public safety has proven the skeleton key to that. It has given them a way to get around everything and say, okay, these things are not safe anymore, and it's all about keeping you safe. But simply going to church has been impossible up until very recently, and even then, uh, mass gatherings of 50 people or more, we need a COVID um, proof of uh, vaccination to get in. Uh, things, I mean, not even political rallies, going to a restaurant, for example, and um, Lindsay Shepard did a report from Hope, British Columbia with Raleigh's Restaurant, which was a restaurant that had uh, not been checking people's vaccination status before they let people in. And uh, that was recently shut down by public health uh, because of a court order. These are things um, that in a small community really, really matter. Um, the, the restaurant employed 40 people, for example. And so again, all I have to do is get in my vehicle. I can drive around and I can see places that have been shut down for a long time or have capacity limits or only let two people in at a time because the, the, uh, the owners aren't comfortable. Uh, people are scared. People are also concerned. They want to be doing the right thing. Um, but uh, I, I just, I, I, I'm concerned about where it's all going, like everybody. I mean, I, I believe in us, I believe in Canadians, I believe in people and common sense, and we need to be courageous that, you know, we might have things under control or we need to accept risk. And I'm worried that this constant alarmism is causing people to think that no risk is worth it, that, you know, we can't risk a single life and that even if it takes away the rights of hundreds of thousands of people. Well, I, I couldn't have said it any better myself, Harley. I think that that, that mindset that, you know, one, one death is too many. I mean, that's just counter to life. Sadly, uh, bad things happen sometimes. And that's part of life. That's part of the risk calculation of getting out of bed every day and, and going out of your front door, getting into a car. Um, for goodness sake, there's there's so many things that that are a bigger risk than than COVID, and yet we've allowed COVID to sort of become this all all powerful force. I I, I will just push back on one point you made. I've lived in small towns and, and big cities too, and uh, when the when the pandemic first broke out, I mean my my family and I we live pretty close to downtown Toronto, and we used to get together uh, with uh, there's a group of moms, so it was like a mom and tot group in the local church basement, and as soon as COVID hit. They, they shut it down and uh, we all stayed in touch through a whatsapp group and i just got a message uh, the other day saying that that starting in january 2022 we're going to be allowed to have this uh, mom, mom and talk group again in the local church basement so those kind of um, groups do exist <laughs> in big cities although I, I do agree that 
they're not as common um, as, as they would be in, in, in the smaller towns. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how, not, not the government, um, not the restrictions uh, from the top down, uh, but how, how our society has changed because of COVID. Because w- one of the things I notice is, is you know, a, a place like Canada that used to kind of be neighborly and friendly and, and you got this idea that people, everyone's polite and, and that we're all kind of in it together. And, and then I, I feel like COVID has brought the worst out in us, like seeing some of the comment sections and the way people talk about the unvaccinated and the way that the unvaccinated talk about the vaccinated and the way that, I, I mean, th- there's so many examples of people calling the police on their neighbors uh, for having too many cars in the driveway and, and supposed party. There, there's been so many issues I've seen, Harley, uh, that, 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 that kind of challenged my idea of, of Canadians and the spirit of Canadians. Uh, what, what, what do you think it is uh, about COVID and, and the threat of, of this sort of mysterious disease um, that, that, that has caused so many people to sort of, you know, family members pitted against each other over uh, their belief about vaccines? Uh, what, what, why do you think this has happened? Is this anything that you, that you thought was possible in Canada? It's a really good question. Um, I think in some ways it's an exhaust valve for political correctness in the sense that we've been told for so long um, to um, not say certain things, uh, to not discriminate, to be a certain way. Um, we've been all, we've been policing ourselves for a really long time. And now with um, the unvaccinated is, is a group that we can legitimately hate. Um, it's, it's a group that the government uh, has, has come out explicitly and said is, is people to be condemned. Um, it, it, there, there's, there's nowhere that's saying this is, not, this is not appropriate. This is a form of discrimination. This is, this is an unprotected group, uh, so, uh, socio-legally speaking. Um, because I mean, and I say socio-legally because the people um, are doing it and legally I don't think there's there's a will to keep it from happening because right now there's so much going on with vaccine mandates that that have yet to be stopped they've been challenged and uh, whenever someone uh, is in a, is is um, bucking the trend or trying to say circumvent it like like the the restaurant in British Columbia uh, there are whistleblowers everywhere calling in your neighbors and of course when we talk about calling your neighbors people have resorted to, uh, the example of um, neighbors uh, ratting each other out in Nazi Germany, and that that has been always a convenient leaping point for the left as well. Uh, but in this case, um, like I said, I'm worried that we've been somehow um, told to um, be be so polite and 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 so uh, how can I put it? Uh, watch our language. Um, uh, be careful uh, who we speak out against to the point that that now that we have a scapegoat, it's open season. That's my worry. That's my worry because it's the only way to explain how it has become so vehement, so and so vitriolic. Because I've heard the same thing too. It it, is, it has become this narrative, um, no longer um, where the virus came from, for example, or whether the government's policies or measures have been successful. Everything is now blamed on this one group of people. And are there ways you can counter that? Like, who do you blame when, say, 100% of the population is vaccinated? But at the point, at, at this point in Canada, that is the group. And 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 I mean, if one group can can be uh, isolated like that, then other groups can be isolated. And I think it falls back into the, unfortunately, the leftist narrative that we're actually fundamentally very bad people that need to be kept in line. So I don't I don't like to see it at all. Yeah, I mean, so it, what, what you say totally reminds me of, you know, the liberals. The liberals used to openly condemn the conservatives and, and Trudeau used to do a pretty good job of, of uh, you know, directing his anger at conservative politicians and not sort of small C conservative Canadians. But in the last election, we, we, we saw that anger uh, be directed at, at entire groups of people, like you said, the, the unvaccinated, sort of scapegoated, um, the, the way that Trudeau spoke down about them. You know, these are Canadian citizens who, who have just as much of a right uh, to their beliefs as any other Canadian. And, and to see that shift uh, was, was pretty alarming. But to, to your point, you know, the Liberals used to be the one that would speak out against the Conservatives, accusing them of um, fear-mongering about immigration and, and, and refugees, um, uh, about uh, condemning Conservatives. Remember, they, they characterized a Conservative pledge in 2011 um, for a, a, a hotline that people could call um, to report cultural violence, um, violence against women. 
um, and the liberals characterize that as a snitch line. And so all of these kind of things that the liberals used to speak out against, they're now doing themselves. Uh, you know, conservatives used to care a lot about freedom. We used to hear conservatives always talk about being the party of freedom, free, free, free markets, uh, religious freedom, freedom of speech. And, and even the NDP used to be the sort of party of civil liberties um, and, and left libertarians. And now we don't really hear any of the parties talking about freedom. We don't really hear that at all. So Harley, what do you think we can do um, you know, as journalists, as reporters, as writers, as Canadians, um, to, to try to shift the focus back towards protecting uh, our freedoms, being vigilant about it, because, you know, it's a slippery slope. And I, I think we take, we take it for granted that, that we live in this wonderful, free, peaceful society. And it's not a given that it's going to be this way 50 years from now. And I, I, I worry about, you know, the direction we're going. So what's, what's, your, what's your take on all of this? Well, I believe outlets like True North are essential um, because um, they're the, I mean, they're almost like on, on the rebellion side of it at this point, because the narrative has been so concerted, the, the mainstream narrative, um, that um, we're essentially being canceled for speaking out, but outlets that can hold on and keep pushing the truth um, will become increasingly attractive to people that just start to think, and I do believe they will start to think, why am I, why am I hearing the same message over and over and over again? Why am I not allowed to question what I'm hearing? Why is it the moment somebody has a question, they are told to be quiet, they are kicked out, they are fired? Like that, this isn't right. And I do believe in people. I believe in everyday people. I don't believe in, you know, political classes, things like that, because you know they they become saturated with the interests of their of their own group. I believe in everyday people, voters, electorate workers, things like that, and um, they're the ones I think that that will start to wake up if and I believe there already are awake let's I don't I don't mean to say it that way I believe when you talk to people a lot of people realize this is wrong um, I think it's just a matter of telling them that their voice matters I think it's sad that we're in a situation where we do need to reassure people in Canada their voice matters because it is a western democracy I don't know where we got to the point that we just that, that we didn't think our voice mattered enough that we couldn't challenge uh, you know our political overlords uh, but uh, I just think just bring up more stories about how this is affecting everyday people, um, bring to light the, the, the gravity and consequences of some of these policies, where they're headed, where they could go from now, because, um, you know, people, it, freedoms aren't lost in one fell swoop, you know, like it starts with a knock on the door and somebody saying we're here to help and then gradually it goes from there and it becomes something more, much more insidious. So I think it just uh, believe in people, um, be honest. Uh, don't shut people down when they say things that, you know, aren't fashionable. It, it's all about, again, a fundamental right, which is freedom of speech. And that's, that's been constantly under assault. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what level of the dungeon it's in right now, but uh, freedom of speech has, uh, hasn't seen the light of day for, for a while now. Well, really closely connected to freedom of speech is freedom of the press, uh, freedom to, to report. And one of the sort of other troubling trends in our society, Harley, is the sort of growing reach of government within media companies and journalism in Canada. There's very few federal national reporters anymore that aren't somehow either funded or subsidized by the Trudeau government. And that has a real perverse effect on the, the issues that, that matter to the journalists, the way they report. And, and, and I think that is part of the problem as well. You sent me an amusing, uh, it's sort of amusing, sort of terrifying and sad um, article from, from the CBC. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about it now. It's, it's, the headline here is, words and phrases you may want to think twice about using. Historical cultural context important for phrases like grandfathered in and spirit animal. And then basically the whole article is, uh, you know, we're hearing from experts, we're hearing from woke experts uh, telling us that our language is racist, sexist, or ableist, and that we should just scrub these words out of the out of our vocabulary. To me, whenever journalists or government officials uh, stand over us and tell us uh, that we must not use words anymore. Um, it, it, you know, you, you talked about how snitch lines felt a little bit like Nazi Germany, um, you know, erasing words from the dictionary. It feels very Orwellian, um, very much like a totalitarian North Korea. Uh, what, what, what were your thoughts when you, when you first saw this article, Harley? 
Uh, well, Cosman just wrote a piece on it for True North. I, I urge people to go check it out. Um, my first reaction is to laugh. Um, I don't want to give uh, give them too much power here. Uh, it's ridiculous when you start um, singling out phrases like, you know, sold down the river as being like deeply racist and we must avoid doing them. And also implying that that somehow certain people have antennas that pick up the meanings of these. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scholar of language. I love etymologies. I love languages. You can dig down into the very molecules of words and they, they meant different things at different times. And I, uh, you can explore them as a, as a labyrinth. They, they, and it's, sure, you can find things that you could interpret as insulting in some capacity, but most people, when they say a word, it just means a thing straightforward. They're just trying to get a point across. Uh, the, their thoughts and their words are the same thing, and it's their intention that matters. You can tell when you're talking to someone whether that person hates you or not. At least you should be able to. Some people have mastered um, the ability to do it, but um, and it's 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 that 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 uh, intention that matters, not the word they're using. Uh, George Orwell actually wrote a, a very important essay called "Politics in the English Language," where he said you can say extremely cruel and and um, and politically incorrect things using very acceptable language, and you can also do the opposite. You can use a um, very uh, inappropriate language to express, express something as politically incorrect. One example that I've used um, came from the inner city where, and excuse me, somebody said, uh, hoes is people too, hoes deserve the vote. You know, that is a politically correct mentality uh, expressed politically incorrect language. Um, but I go back to 2017 also where uh, Justin Trudeau, if you remember, used the word people kind. Um, when uh, when uh, someone in a, a, a town hall used the word mankind. And uh, I think I think he thought he was being funny. Um, but you know, with 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 the liberals now you never know. Um, and uh, the idea that somehow man is inherently sexist, and uh, that we must say people at all times. And the word man originally meant human and mankind refers to all humankind. And it becomes an academic exercise, literally. And we start getting into all the different meanings of words and where they come from. And that's why it's neat to pick up a book of etymology and the origins of, of, of phrases. Um, Cause it's just, you know, it's just a, a jaunt into, into the past. Um, these are things we have to, we have to um, come to learn, not things that we somehow know by speaking a language. But to get back to your point about um, it being, um, you know, insidious, uh, canceling speech and making certain ideas um, uh, inappropriate for public discourse has always been um, the goal of the opponents of free speech. And that's not to deny that hurtful terms don't exist, but we know what they are. We don't need to, be, need to be tapped on the shoulders and told, actually, that's a bad word. We know what the bad words are. We're grownups. We speak English. Um, but when people come along and they say, no, 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 it's not just about whole categories of thought or arguments that are wrong. They try to tell you the very elements of language are wrong. They are trying to take away the very fibers of the carpet you're standing on. And think how hard it would be to formulate an argument, even, even to organize your own thoughts, when you are worried that every word you use might contain something either offensive or that will turn you into a deplorable in the eyes of the respectable classes. And I think that is probably the most evil side of this. That said, I think it's funny. I think it's, it's, a, silly, it's a silly article. It's fun to laugh at. But taken to extremes, it is trying to rip our tongues out. It's trying to rob us of a fundamental tool of civilization, which is the, which is the ability to make our thoughts known to others and to communicate them. I, that was just so well articulated, Harley. I really appreciate that. It, it, it reminds me, there's a part in Douglas Murray's book, The Madness of Crowds, where he, he talked about cancel culture. And part of the problem is that the rules are constantly changing. So you may say something or do something that's perfectly appropriate today in 2021, but the rules uh, that the left is creating the woke mob is constantly evolving. And so something that you say that's fine and politically correct today may not be politically correct tomorrow. And, and the, the impact that that has on society and your ability to, like you say, think clearly, speak clearly. I mean, I'll, I'll just pull out a couple of silly examples from the CBC article because it's so absurd. I, I think your point is 
completely correct that they're they're trying to push fear and instill fear into people that no matter what they do they're not going to be like like there's hidden meanings in our words even if we don't have those intentions um and and the effect is is chilling speech like one of the examples is not to use the term spooky around halloween that, that spooky is used around halloween to describe something that's frightening or strange or scary like a ghost um, however, there's this, uh, you know, obscure reference that during World War II, it was used as a racial slur against black soldiers. Um, so, so because of that, even though the, the purpose of the word is different, it's not even the same word, right? But, but you're, you shouldn't even use that word spooky at Halloween because it could be perceived by some hypersensitive small group as being racist. Another one that we've heard a lot of, I don't know if this was in the article or not, it probably was, uh, but, but the idea that you shouldn't use the term master bedroom to, to describe a master that you know the the, the 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 grand the big the biggest room in the house um and 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 the, the interesting thing is that the, the use of that word master bathroom it came into effect because i read about this when i first heard people try and say don't use that word and, and it didn't have anything to do with slavery it didn't have anything to do with the you know jim crow south or whatever uh, the term master bedroom was created by the real estate industry after the second world war when there was the boom um, and, and it was designed to make people feel like they are the master of their own domain and the master of their own home. So, so it doesn't even, both these words, it doesn't even have the root of, uh, you know, anything to do with being racist. However, they're sort of superficially imposing that onto any word that sounds like it might sound like a word that might have a bad meaning. And, you know, this, this erasing of our language, to me, it's, it, I agree, it's funny. And this article is so stupid, but at the same time, I know what they're doing and, as we've seen from recent history, like like their the woke push towards uh, you know changing our language, it's it's having an impact. It's successful. How many people do you see nowadays that put their pronouns um, in their profile or on, in their bio? You know, a couple of years ago when Jordan Peterson first started talking about this issue, it was like it was like this is a very strange academic university battle, and now it's like all around us. And 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 it's like you know when they come up with these ideas. And, and, and start pushing it. They, they just seem to have a lot of success of steamrolling uh, people, Harley. So uh, all, all that's just to say, <laughs> I, I agree with what you're saying. And um, I, I, I thank you for, um, for bringing this to my attention. Uh, what, what, what do you think about all that? Well, I mean, the first thing that came to mind when I looked at the article was that the word lady refer, etymologically refers to the kneading of dough. The, the, the lady part refers to like a loaf of bread. It's like hlof d, the meat became lady over time. So is that insulting? Does that imply all women belong in the kitchen? You could make that argument. I could have written an article like this completely satirically, which is why it's yeah, it was funny. But then again, most people who read it probably don't have that ability. Um, they just look at it and they would laugh or they'd be scared. Um, but again, there are stupid examples. I read stupid examples in there saying, for example, first world problems. We, we, use the, we use the phrase first world problems, but it's in a way of recognizing how spoiled we actually are. Um, and they, uh, the article will say, oh, it's actually insulting to uh, you know, uh, less developed countries. Well, no, it's not. It's making fun of us. I remember talking to a coworker when he was asking how things are going in town with the recovery. And I said, oh, our Wi-Fi isn't up yet. But if that's the worst of it, then I guess we're doing pretty well. He said, yeah, first world problems. You know, so saying, you know, saying we're gonna cancel terms like that along with the terms we all recognize to be bad it's just it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and i think it gets us back to laughing at it again um even though as you said some of this stuff makes too much headway because i don't think we know quite how to challenge it yet and unless we use words in a in a in a, in a more kind of blunt fashion try and uh you know that doesn't work either trying to uh for example, uh, reappropriate terms that have been deemed politically incorrect in the past. Uh, and uh, if I could make one more, one more analogy about it, um, certain things that we're constantly replacing the words for be they, because they become unacceptable. Uh, a, new, a new word comes out every few years, for example, that we're supposed to use. And some of us don't understand why. They're like, what, what's wrong with the other word? Oh, well, it's, it's racist or insensitive. And I would argue, well, then it's not the word. In that case, the word is almost a bandage. And it's the wound beneath that is that is becoming infected and it's infecting the bandage. So maybe it's this constant preoccupation with, with the thing it referring to as being bad and not the word. But again, a lot of us don't don't didn't have a problem with the concepts to begin with. So uh, 
it's it's a slippery slope i agree and, and learning to keep a, keep abreast of these things is like being bilingual it's like speaking a socially acceptable language and then speaking a private language um but uh in this case i think it's uh the examples are careless and silly enough that i think we can all laugh at them so i recommend people just check out the article and you know check out the uh the list of words because they're they're pretty funny it's it's certainly a silly and i'm glad that true north uh, covered it so if you don't want to uh, if you don't want to go to the CBC website, you want to patronize them, you can just check it out uh, through our website, tnc.news. Well, Harley, we're just so thrilled to have you on board. You're, you're obviously just a very well-rounded, uh, well-read, intelligent person. You're going to bring a lot to True North. So we're, we're very lucky to have you and I look, forward to, I look forward to all the things, all the great things hopefully that you're going to do for us. Again, really happy to be here, Candice, and uh, looking forward to talking to you anytime. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Candice Malcolm, and this is The Candice Malcolm Show.